Uh, I understand we're going to conduct these proceedings in English. This is okay with everybody present. Everybody can hear me from here. So we're going to start. Uh, America's, America's standing in the world, image and reality. Uh, I think there's uh, quite a gap between image and reality because we hear, peop hear people talking about uh, the decline of America. Uh, I think it was yesterday, the day before yesterday, that it was announced that China had just passed the United States in uh, GDP. I'm not sure that's right. It depends on how you calculate GDP. But I think China still has a long way to go, a long way to go to catch up with the United States. It is the only superpower uh, on the globe, I think probably for some time to come. It's a great power, ideologically great power, economically great power, militarily great power, technologically. American culture is conquering the entire world, and in due time, probably China as well. So the talk about uh, the decline of the United States, I think, is uh, certainly exaggerated and probably also, also premature if it ever happens in our lifetime. So we have a, a number of lectures here today, and we're going to start with uh, Dr. Amit Moore. Dr. Amit Moore. Uh, He's uh, the energy market and U.S. foreign policy is the title of his talk. He's an energy economist, energy strategist, and a financial analyst, the CEO and co-owner of Echo Energy, an Israeli-based strategic and financial consulting and investment firm that specializes in the energy, environmental, and infrastructure sector. Dr. Moore. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Moshe Arens, and I'd uh, like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Just a minute. Thank you. Um, I would like to speak this morning about, indeed, the energy uh, aspect of the U.S. Uh, energy policy. And uh, we will start with um, just uh, speaking a few minutes about recent events. And this is, I would say, the collapse of the petroleum prices. The, in the past uh, two months, oil prices have decreased about 40%. And this morning, about $62.5 uh, per barrel of uh, West Texas Intermediate. That's uh, a leading U.S. brand. Of, uh, of petroleum, um, prices were about more than $100 just uh, two or uh, three months ago uh, during the, the summertime. Now, what is the major reason for this um, decline, huge decline, five uh, years low uh, in the petroleum prices? And basically, uh, before the reasons, what, what is the impact? The impact is that the world is going to save if this level, and I uh, calculated uh, this morning about $70 per barrel, if this level of prices will remain uh, for, a, for a year, so all of us, the consumers in the world, are going to um, benefit or save $1.2 trillion. This is $1.2 trillion, which uh, a decreasing income to the petroleum uh, uh, producing countries and the oil companies. And basically, uh, to the U.S. alone, out of this $1.2 trillion, the U.S. is going to uh, benefit or save about $280 billion. A small country like Israel will save about $3 billion. And the Russia, I'll speak about China, Russia and uh, Iran, for example, still the two largest oil producers in the world, are going to lose some $140 billion each, a decreasing income from $360 billion in average um, last year to about $220 billion. And this major decline in income has a, a, a huge economic and I would say also political impact uh, on Russia, on Saudi, on many other uh, oil producers. And we we'll speak about Iran in a minute. You asked about uh, China. No doubt that China is becoming 
already two years ago, uh, bypassed the US as the largest energy consumer in the world. The, both the US and China consumed about one quarter of the energy in the world. Now uh, China have uh, bypassed the US, not only uh, the largest economy as was announced by the IMF last week, in terms of energy consumption, in terms of oil uh, consumption, the U.S. is still the leader. It consumes about 19 million barrels per day uh, out of 90, one nine, 19, out of 90 uh, million barrels per day that the world uh, produces and consumes. Now, look at this figure uh, uh, that um, the International Energy Agency, the IEA, published two years ago. What we see uh, in this graph on the horizontal uh, axis is the gas import uh, dependency and on the, uh, that, that's on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis, the oil import dependency of various countries, sorry? Oh, thank you. Um, on various regions in the world. So for example, look at Japan. Japan in 2010 in, 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 uh, in um, uh, blue and uh, 2035, 20 years from now, in red. So Japan, for example, um, is totally dependent both on oil and gas imports, 100% today, and uh, the forecast is continue to be dependent, totally dependent on, on oil and gas imports. Look at the European Union. The European Union uh, imports 60% of its gas and more than 80% of its oil, and it's going to increase sorry, its dependency to about 90% oil imports and more than 80% gas imports. India, again, will I increase its dependency from 20% gas and about 70% uh, oil to more than 50% imports on gas or 90% imports of oil. China, China imports now less than 20% of its gas and about 50, close to 60% of its oil. It's going to increase its dependency to about 40% gas and more than 80% oil. Look at the United States, however. In contradiction to all other countries, the US is becoming very fast energy independent. It is uh, these days importing about 50% of its oil and used to import in 2010 about 15%, 1.5% of its gas, and very quickly it's going to turn to, to become a gas exporter, and also decrease significantly, almost totally, its oil imports. So this is a very significant move on behalf of the United States, which has, a, I think, a major also a geopolitical a influence and on the, the, on the US foreign policy, as we'll discuss in a minute. Now, how does this uh, happen? And as we see in the past few years, technological developments, major technological developments, has occurred in the oil and gas industry, which enable the US, and right now it's only the US, to utilize a new, brand new technology, because it operated only the past six, seven years, which called hydraulic fracking. What does it mean? It's to uh, utilize or to pump oil and gas, which is captured in the layers of the rock, in the shale, a layer of the rock. And as you see in this uh, slide, basically in the past 20 years, the development of a technology of horizontal drilling. So in the past, people knew, oil companies knew to drill only vertically. But in the past 20 years, they developed technology to, 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 to drill horizontally, and then with huge pressure of steam, a lot of water is required, and, chemi and chemicals and sands in very high pressure, basically frack the rock, creates cracks in the rock, uh, one can say bomb the rock in this respect, huge pressure, creates cracks, and the oil, or in other places gas, is being um, uh, exploited and drilled in this new, brand new technology. So very fast, what is the cost of extraction? The f uh, we'll see in a minute, okay. we'll see in a minute the cost of extraction. Now basically what it turned to be about six years ago, in terms of gas production, gas was not produced in this way, already th one third of the gas in the US is produced in this technology, and already growing amounts of oil is also used, uh, being drilled in this technology. Now look at these uh, graphs on the upper, 
left, we see the oil production in the US, which uh, declined until 2006, 7 uh, to the lowest point of about 5 million barrels per day. As recall, um, the US consumes about 18, 19 million barrels per day. It's a huge decline throughout the year. The peak was in the early 70s of about 10 million barrels per day of production was a decline. And since then, in the past three or uh, uh, four to uh, three to four years, a major increase in production of oil, especially of this tight oil, non-conventional oil from oil shells or from the shale oil, it is being called. Also on the gas and uh, the, the, the consumption in, uh, the, uh, started already six, seven years ago, and the US basically increased its oil production by 50% and continued production, uh, uh, anticipated that we'll see in a minute, the uh, same with gas. So vis-a-vis uh, -vis your question, what is the marginal oil production cost in the US? This is, uh, uh, was published last week in the Financial Post. Uh, this graph, basically what we see here is that the break-even point, what is the economic value of Brent oil, of, uh, what is the uh, price of oil in which new production should take place in this non-conventional technology as we described. And here we see various fields which are planned to be developed by various oil and gas companies in the U.S., in South uh, Sulija, Marcellus, in uh, the major uh, field in, uh, in Pennsylvania, and many other, uh, the bacon uh, field, and so on and so forth, we see that the break-even cost is starting from 40 basically to $80. Some of, the, of these oil fields will be developed only if oil price will be $80. So what is the reason for this collapse in prices? It's especially the huge increase in supply of oil in the markets in a period where the major uh, consumer, which is China, is experiencing um, a relative decline in economic growth. It used to grow 10% annual increase in GDP in the past decade. It is growing this past year and this year about 4 5%. So major decrease in the, great, in, in the rate of growth in oil production, so there is a glut, the over excess supply of oil in the market was the, with the U.S. decreased its consumption in the past five years since the Depression in 2008 by about more than 10 percent, especially um, in the if more efficient cars, utilizing less gasoline uh, in transportation uh, and smaller cars uh, that the U.S. public is purchasing. So in this respect, there is a major efficiency. So on the one hand, the U.S. is decreasing its consumption. On the other hand, it's decreasing its production. China is experiencing uh, not a recession, but a halt in a way uh, in, in economic growth. So we have a glut of excess supply. Economic prices dec uh, decreases. And OPEC last week, with the leadership of Saudi Arabia, decided not to curtail, not to lower um, the production. And the reason is exactly what we saw uh, in, in the former graph, that the Saudi Arabia, in fact, declared some type of economic war against the U.S. oil producers. It wants to maintain, and other members in OPEC, they want to maintain its, uh, its market share. They want to avoid developers of shale oil in the U.S. to continue to develop uh, more oil fields, and in this respect, Indeed, trying to achieve um, a, a decrease in U.S. oil uh, production and already starting to achieve that because in the past two months, several U.S. oil and gas companies announced that it, in this level of relatively low level of prices or lower level of prices, they are going to postpone development of some of the fields that we just saw earlier. So there is an economic war developing in this uh, respect, which we, the consumers all enjoy. Now, this slide was, uh, was released two days ago by the um, International Energy Agency in the upcoming World Energy Outlook, which is going to be published next week. What we see here is where the excess oil is going to come until 2040. What we see in, in yellow is that the excess production in the U.S., indeed will continue until the early 2020s and Canada 
in blue, Brazil in green, and then we have here in black, that's the Middle East. So we see that the U.S. is going to increase its production until the early 2020s, and then it's going to decrease its production according to this estimate of the International Energy Agency. Canada, the same, increased production of tight oil and then decreasing production, and then Brazil and especially the Middle East, and within the Middle East, especially Iraq, is anticipated to increase its production. So what does it mean to U.S. policy? First, look at what happens since the, 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 the end of the Second World War. 70 years ago, about 69 years ago, the U.S., in fact, uh, is controlling the flow of oil from the Persian Gulf and maintain thousands, tens of thousands of troops in the Persian Gulf and basically just for one primary reason, to secure the flow of oil from that region, which started to emerge as a major production uh, area uh, f a bit before the Second World War, but the British controlled this area, Iraq especially, and uh, especially after the Second World War. What does it mean? It means that according to calculation that we made, that U.S. Tax taxpayers paid about two trillion, two thousand million billion dollars throughout the past 70 years just to guarantee the flow of oil, which means to guarantee the continuation of, of, of the control of those uh, corrupt regimes, Saudi and the other um, countries in the region, maintain um, army bases, um, um, airplane carriers, and so on and so forth, to secure the flow of oil from the Strait of Formos to the markets in the US, Europe, Japan, and other US allies. But, but okay, what is happening in the past uh, decade? In the past decade, what's going on? Is, here is China, China, Shanghai, Shanghai 30 years ago, and Shanghai today. And those of you who visited or not, what's happening in many other countries, uh, cities in, the, in, in China, and Manhattan is starting to be shy in this respect. The uh, energy consumption has doubled. Not only energy, minerals, food, the requirements uh, for, for, for resources in China is used in China, is doing whatever it can to, to get these resources, including oil. And where oil was uh, flowing from the Persian Gulf to the United States, Europe, and other uh, Japan, other uh, US allies in the past, these days, in the past few years, it is flowing especially where? To China and India. And the question rises, why should US taxpayers continue to sponsor by tens of billions of dollars a year, huge troops to secure the flow of oil to where? To China? So that's the reason that I think that already, not, not, only, not the only reason, but a major reason to disengagement of the US from the Middle East. The US is almost not relied at all on Gulf oil, less than 5% of its consumption currently, and going to reduce its dependency. So I don't say that the US is going to disengage totally. I think that the US has other interests to like to deter Iran. It, won't, it will maintain some troops, most likely, to continue to secure the flow of oil. But I assume that the process that we are seeing, this engagement from Iraq, from other areas, will continue. And the US taxpayers will, ask, will start asking the questions, not asking yet those questions, why we should continue to sponsor so much US activity in this area. So, uh, and, and this major change in US policy, foreign policy, because uh, is derived because of the uh, energy independent that the US is gaining in the past uh, few uh, years. Okay, um, I will um, escape a few slides that I wanted to discuss in Iran and just finish with uh, these slides. What is the vision? Our vision here in Israel, which also share many of our friends in the United States. Since the US is gaining so much resources of gas, our vision is that the U with the leadership of the US, possibly the demonstration of a small country of Israel, in the next 20 years, we are going to reduce dramatically our dependency 
an addiction to oil because 70% of the oil is aimed for transportation, gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. And that can be done by shifting to natural gas-based transportation technology, technologies, compressed natural gas, production of methanol, a liquid like gasoline from methane, from natural gas, electric cars, plug-in electric cars in Israel, we discovered a, lot, a huge resources of gas in the US with huge resources of gas, can produce electricity to charge batteries of, uh, of vehicles and so on, and also other alternative fuels to diversify from oil. And if it's going to be happen, and we, we see the starting of this process in the US and also in a small microcosm of Israel, we can demonstrate to, our, uh, to ourselves and to the world that it is possible, and once, if this estimate of the, U of the IEA will show correctly that the U.S. will decline oil production early next decade, so the U.S. will have other energy uh, sources, especially for transportation, which will provide the U.S. major degrees of freedom to continue uh, its international uh, foreign policy with not relying on Gulf oil uh, and, and that's why I continue to this engagement from the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. So I guess natural gas is the name of the game from now on, for Israel anyway, right? CGN. Okay, we now go on to Dr. Emily uh, Landau. The subject is U.S. counterproliferation, the Iran case. Dr. Landau is a senior research fellow and head of the Arms Control and the Regional Security Program at the Institute for National Security Studies. Dr. Landau, please. Uh, good morning. Um, so we're shifting gears. <laughs> Uh, to the nuclear non-proliferation issue. And I'm going to begin with the unfortunate conclusion that the international community as a whole and the United States as a leading power on the global scene is ill-equipped to stop a determined NPT member state proliferator from reaching the goal of a threshold or actual nuclear weapons capability. The prospects of success are especially dim if the policy choice is to go through the motions of referring the case to the IAEA, to the International Atomic Energy Agency, confronting the state with evidence of wrongdoing, and then trying to compel the state to back away from its military aspirations by means of negotiations and diplomacy. And unfortunately, Iran is an excellent case in point. Um, and I'll try to explain why that is the case, at least in very broad strokes, uh, because we have very limited time. First of all, a US policy with regard to determined proliferators um, in today's world cannot be analyzed in detachment from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty because all potential proliferators are members of this treaty. North Korea left in 2003, but in the years it was proliferating, it was a member, and they're all members in the status of non-nuclear weapon states. The NPT, therefore, is the source of legitimacy for the international community to come to these states and confront them on their suspected violations of the treaty. But what I want to look maybe a little bit more closely at is that the treaty is also a serious constraint to counterproliferation efforts because it has unwittingly provided dangerous cover for determined proliferators due to its support for civilian nuclear programs for the non-nuclear weapon states based on dual, what we call dual-use technology. Uranium enrichment is dual-use technology. It can be used for a civilian nuclear program, but it can, it's also what you need for a military nuclear program. States like Iran, Iraq in the 1980s, Syria, North Korea, 
that have strived to acquire a military nuclear capability in recent decades have all abused the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, in order to do so. They all advanced military capabilities under the guise of a civilian nuclear program. Now, when it was negotiated, the architects of the NPT did not envision the determined proliferators that it's dealing with today. And it did not provide proper tools for seeking out and effectively confronting violations, which explains why this has been such a lengthy and cumbersome process. Iran learned how to abuse the ambiguity of the loopholes in the NPT to its best advantage. And in a nutshell, this explains why Iran was able to go from several hundred centrifuges to the 19,000 that it has today, um, from a very small amount of low enriched uranium to the amount of LEU that it has today that, if enriched to higher levels, can support six to seven nuclear devices. Now, all of this doesn't mean that the United States has been averse to using a force in counterproliferation efforts. And the Iraq War of 2003 obviously is a case in point. However, not only did force prove to be unnecessary in the Iraq case, because WMD were not found, but it ended up, unfortunately, having a broader detrimental effect on future counterproliferation efforts in Iran and North Korea. Indeed, this failure was largely responsible for the conclusion that, uh, and this was prevalent across the international community, that diplomacy and inducements, not force and pressure, should be the strategy of choice for dealing with proliferation threats in Iran and North Korea. And this set us on the course for what has proven to be a prolonged, a very prolonged and unsuccessful negotiation with each of these determined proliferators. So why has it been so hard to stop Iran through negotiations? There are a number of reasons for this. As I mentioned, the problems stem from the NPT itself. Specifically, Article 4 that allows non-nuclear weapon states to have a civilian nuclear program. Um, and this is the dual-use loophole. There are no clear criteria or benchmarks for declaring violations, and there's no clear process for following through with effective decision-making when a violation is identified. A second factor that has worked against effective negotiations is that the structure of this negotiation is what I call not a normal negotiation, in the sense that there are not two parties that have a shared interest in reaching a negotiated solution. That's what you need to support what I call a normal negotiation. Here we have one side, the P5 plus 1, that are interested in a negotiated deal and in, are even dependent on a negotiated deal because they don't want to consider other strategies such as use of force. Iran, on the other hand, has absolutely no interest in a negotiated deal. Iran will only go for this deal if it's pressured into it. If Iran comes to the conclusion that it has no choice because Iran actually wants the option of a military nuclear capability. Iran doesn't want to give this up. It's been working on this capability for decades, from the 1980s. And it's paid a high price for it. So please be under no illusions. Iran will not give this up unless it feels that it has no choice. We don't have a situation where the two sides are moving towards a shared goal of Iran backing away from its uh, military aspirations. More importantly, Iran doesn't need the international community to get where it needs to go. Iran can move to a military capability on its own. So you understand that the structure is lopsided. One side wants the negotiated settlement, is dependent on it. 
The other side has absolutely no interest in it. And the only way to make this a more equal negotiation is if Iran comes to the conclusion that it's better to cooperate than to move forward, and that means severe pressure. And a, a third factor is that in terms of the negotiations dynamic, Iran has had the upper hand in this negotiation. Iran is playing a tactical game of buying time to push its program forward, but was never seriously considering steps, and I'm taking a, the long view from 2003, that would undermine or harm its program and plans. Iran is one state very determined, knows where it wants to go and what it wanted to achieve. Iran, since 2003, has been operating according to a very simple principle, move its program forward at maximum speed, but at minimum cost to itself. Uh, the P5 plus one have been a group that lacks unity and a common position on almost all the important issues. And it's also dependent, as I said, on a negotiated deal, which is a source of weakness at the negotiating table. Iran got very good over the years at exploiting the ambiguity in the NPT. Iran would haggle over interpretations. Iran continues to haggle over interpretations with regard to the interim deal. This is a well-known Iranian tactic. Um, and it used a variety of delay tactics, including divide and conquer. Iran learned that ambiguity serves its interest and enabled it to play a game of crisis avoidance that made it that much more difficult for the other side to confront it with determination. And all the time, Iran used the time to push forward its nuclear program to enhance its nuclear infrastructure. The more Iran has been able to build up its infrastructure, the harder it will be for the international community to get Iran to roll back. The Iraq war, as I mentioned, created problems. I'll mention two main constraints that are a result of the Iraq war. First of all, it weakened Western determination in the critical early years, from 2003 to 2008 and even up to 2011. Because negotiators and diplomats kept asking themselves, do we really know that Iran is working on a military capability? Maybe we're making the same mistake in Iran that we made in Iraq. And this had a very uh, um, a, a detrimental effect on the negotiations. Second, the result of the, of the Iraq war caused the United States, in particular, to be gun shy. Um, and this undermined an important potential source of leverage at the negotiating table, namely the impact of a credible threat of military consequences for Iran's lack of seriousness. After trying inducements to change Iran's calculations in the early years, 2003 to 2006, by 2006, international negotiators were on the path of pressure, but they went through the Security Council and remember, the members of, permanent members of the Security Council are not on the same page. And what happened is that from 2006 to 2010, that's a long time, four years, they were going for sanctions only through or primarily through the Security Council, and every resolution was watered down to the lowest common denominator, usually led by China and Russia. Effective sanctions came at a very late stage, only in 2012. That's very late, that's nine years after the international community first started negotiating with Iran. A final point to note is although this negotiation is fundamentally a game of compellence in the face of zero-sum interests of the two sides, the international negotiators have often mistakenly been playing it as if it's a normal negotiation. And you hear all the time statements that are made by diplomats on the P5 plus one side describing this negotiation in terms of as if both sides are moving to a mutually desired goal. But Iran is not playing this game. And this is what has made it difficult. Um, you may be wondering whether anything has changed for the better over the past year 
since the negotiations began in October 2013? The answer is not fundamentally. Iran's strategic goal has remained constant. It seeks to advance its nuclear program to achieve a breakout capability that will enable it to move to nuclear weapons at a time of its choosing. What did change? Tactics. Iranian tactics change. So Iran has moved from the game that I described earlier as maximum speed <coughs> at minimal cost. Iran's new game is to get maximum sanctions relief for minimal nuclear concessions. I'll get to that in the Q&A, OK? I think that's the least important question, actually. It's very short. Um, and because in the Ahmadinejad years, Iran had moved very much in the direction of the nuclear progress poll without paying enough attention to the price it was paying, the cost of this, the new strategy is meant to rectify that situation. But it's a tactical shift. There is nothing to indicate that Iran has made a strategic U-turn as far as its nuclear aspirations. In fact, all of the evidence points to the exact opposite conclusion. The goal for the international community, uh, for the international negotiators, sorry, in the latest round of negotiation, was to use their hard-earned leverage with the biting sanctions that they did put in place in 2012 to compel Iran to accept the deal. But rather than trusting their own leverage, what we saw was that the international negotiators began expressing their concerns that if they pressed too hard, Iran would leave the table. But it was the harsh sanctions of 2012 that brought Iran to the table. And therefore, there was a little to support this concern. Um, for the US specifically, over the course of the negotiations on a comprehensive deal since January of this year, rather than communicating to Iran that America was in the driver's seat and was going to drive a hard bargain, the administration began clarifying the issues that they believed there was no way that Iran would concede on. And indeed, at times, at times, there was a sense that the United States was more focused on what might be acceptable to Iran and then adjusting its position accordingly than in setting its own bottom lines and communicating those to Iran. Uh, the United States was also very intent this past year on proving that it was negotiating in good faith, that it was not disrespectful towards this horrific regime. And one could notice the administration almost bending over backwards in order not to do anything that might be construed as lack of respect towards this dangerous proliferator, even though Iran was certainly not responding in kind as far as its expressed attitudes towards the United States. In fact, the Supreme Leader continued to hurl accusations while expressing disdain, contempt, and deep hatred towards the United States of America. The collective effect of these trends was that the United States seemed to be increasingly demonstrating its own eagerness for a deal. And again, this has been weakening its hand at the negotiations table. I'm probably towards the end, right? So I'm just going to say a final word. <laughs> OK. Um, all right, let me just say, from among all the nuclear issues that are on the table right now, even though most of the focus is on the issue of uranium enrichment, in fact, in my opinion, the most important issue that should be on the table is Iran's uh, weaponization activities. And this brings us full circle to the NPT. Remember I said the NPT is the source of legitimacy for confronting proliferators. Therefore, Iran's violation of the NPT by working on a military nuclear program for decades is the justification and the, and the source of legitimacy for the international community to demand everything they're demanding. Dismantlement of centrifuges, closing Fordow, Iraq, 
and all the rest of it. Therefore, the weaponization must be exposed as part of negotiations on a comprehensive deal. And if weaponization is not confronted in the context of a comprehensive deal, it will be, by definition, a bad deal. A final word just on military force and whether there's any role. A credible threats of military consequences, as I said, should have been used as a lever of pressure in the negotiations, but unfortunately, that did not happen. Instead, the United States was projecting a sense of war weariness that undermined this deterrent threat. And to complicate matters, Iran wasn't sitting on the sidelines uh, not doing anything. In fact, Iran was working very hard <laughs> to empty the military threat of any credibility by building up and fortifying its nuclear infrastructure and making it harder and harder for anyone to contemplate military force. Iran also issued its own deterrent threats. And it kept saying what would happen to the international community if they dared attack Iran. And at the end of the day, these deterrent threats that Iran was issuing proved to be more effective than what is still on the, t on the agenda. All options are on the table. We hear President Obama still say this, but I'm not sure that this is impressing the Iranians as a serious option. So the credible threat which could help at the negotiations table in order to change behavior was not used effectively. As for actual employment of military force as a counter-proliferation strategy, it can work. I think it worked in Osirak, in Iraq, in 1981. There's a big debate on this. I think it delayed the program. Others think otherwise. Certainly it worked in Syria in 2007. But it can work only when it is employed at the very earliest stages of a proliferator's activity. If the proliferator is allowed to build up a huge nuclear infrastructure, it's rendered a, pretty much a non-option. Thank you very much. Well, OK. Look, on breakout, according to most assessments, it's something around the order of three to four months. If Iran were to decide it's rushing to uh, create fissile material for a nuclear weapon, it would take it around the order of three or four months right now. And what the international negotiators are trying to do is to lengthen that time to a year, which in a different context, I would argue, is certainly not enough time when we think of all the problems that will be involved when a, a violation is identified. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Landa. A very somber assessment, because everyone has something to worry about. That's my job. <laughs> well, you did it very well, thank you. <laughs> so uh, now we go on to uh, Professor Hillel Frisch, who will talk about the United States and the Middle East offshore balancing, or, or and the Middle East offshore balancing or retreat. Hillel Frisch is an associate professor in the Department of Political Studies and Middle East Studies at bar University and a senior research associate at the Bessa Center. Hello. Hello. Um, basically, my talk is going to be divided into three parts. Um, Israelis have a long history of three parts, as every person who's induced into the army well knows that the rifle is divided into three parts. So the first part will be the inter intellectual and theoretical foundations of Obama's policies. The second are the policy solutions to these problems that theory generated. And um, the third part will be problems of implementation. So um, I think that one of the intellectual foundations for Obama's policy 
although we tried doing a search and finding re a real link, um, a link in terms of quotations, and we couldn't find it, is Paul's Kennedy, Paul Kennedy's thesis of the overextended state. Um, this was a thesis that was proposed in a bestseller book written in the late 1980s and probably influenced Obama in some, in some fashion, um, where he basically proposed a very, very simple theory. Power in the modern world is a function of te technological innovation and strength. He proved that looking at European history since 1500. States must equil equilibrate between the creation of wealth, military expenditures, and the breadth of strategic goals and obligations. Strong states typically decline when there is too much military spending on too widespread strategic objectives at a time of relative economic decline. And what basically Paul Kennedy does through his voluminous book is to try proving that this was the case in many, many um, cases of hegemons or would-be hegemons in the European theater and then um, Brit Great Britain and the United States. Um, at root, of course, um, for that article was, um, for that book was um, the United States relative economic decline. Um, basically, it's very, very relative and it's very, very small. And when one looks at the curve, one sees that America has tremendous abilities of comeback. So um, I don't think one has to be too deterministic about it. So one part of the solution then is to become strategically selective. And this was mentioned, I think, by Stephen David and by Pro Professor Now. Um, and and um, so we'll see how that plays out in American policy. To Kennedy's insights, we must add also Manker Olson's um, very famous book, also in, from the 70s, 80s, and probably influenced in some way or other Obama, who went through um, you know, very good, excellent education in, in, the United, in American top universities. So um, Manker Olson basically said that great states, especially liberal ones, usually champion free markets at home as well as abroad and their liberal nature is what made them great in the first place. The United States, as Great Britain before it, became the world's, first, the world's policeman. Unfortunately, other states take a free ride, um, or what's called buck passing, on the security the great power offers and enjoys the public good without paying for it. Now, to solve the free rider problem, a superpower must engage therefore in offshore balancing, getting local allies to balance against opponents and pay as much as possible their own way. Um, so Obama's Asian pivot policy seems to be influenced by Kennedy and Olson's insights. Um, first of all, the Asian pivot is an indication of selectivity, an attempt to generate wealth which will equilibrate between economic grain, gain and strategic strength to get allies to pay their way, Japan, India, Vietnam, in short, offshore balancing. Becoming more selective, why the Asian pivot? You can look at this graph. It's a World Bank graph, and there's a lot of, there's, there's basically a lie in this graph, which, is, which the West ba World Bank um, often does. It takes regions, and it shows how regions are not growing, and MENA, of course, you can see, hasn't grown at least in Middle East, North Africa, uh, compared to China and South Korea. Uh, but we all know anyway that um, Asian economic performance has far outperformed anything the Middle East has produced in the last 30 years. And then when you look at US, US export growth, it's strongly correlated to foreign growth, and we know that American consumption is not increasing, so you have to generate jobs through export growth, and there are so, so many studies that show that this is true for all regions of the globe, that there's a direct correlation between regional growth and the growth of American exports. Um, uh, so basically, in terms of selectivity, um, Obama got it right. Probably the Asian pivot 
was the proper solution um, for um, over, uh, overextension. And of course, we had a debate here between Stephen David and um, Elliot Cohen over how much American re resolve is there in over the um, Asian pivot. Um, I would say that it's not only in terms of tonnage, ship tonnage, but um, basically Obama has taken very, very strong stances against China over a variety of issues in Asia. I'm not an expert, so I won't, I won't go into it, but um, he has shown some resolve. Um, so basically, um, selectivity, um, in terms of selectivity, Obama should be getting high marks. The problem lies in Obama's concept of offshore balancing, which is the problem generated by the free rider problem. Um, the United States, instead of offshore balancing against foes by aiding local allies, Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, um, is offshore balancing between Iran, a foe, and Turkey, a questionable ally, against regional allies. And I think that this is, uh, this is a tremendous problem. Um, it's, it, it's sort of a policy that has been generated by Walt, Mearsheimer, Kinzer of the, New York, of the New York Times, this idea that the United States should be getting close to Iran and Turkey. Um, and I think it's, it's, that's where the problem, um, basic, the fundamental pro problem lies. Turkey does not live up to its alliance commitments with the US. And um, Iran's nuclear umbrella will lead to nuclear proliferation, increased terrorism, and the prospects of conventional missile proliferation that could threaten Europe. Um, and as Iran free rides on US involvement in the war against ISIS, and again, it gets more basically um, powerful. Um, no, sorry. And we're, we're beginning to see, you can put on the lights basically, I, I think. Um, we're beginning to see some of the problems emanating from this wrong policy of off-balancing. Um, for instance, uh, the Sunnis are beginning to bandwagon with Al-Qaeda to protect, to protect them. Um, and meanwhile, the Yemen, Yemeni, Yemeni government of the post of Dalla Saleh era has capitulated to the Houthis. This, um, this idea of empowering, empow empowering Iran has generated basically two reactions that are very inimical to American and Western interests. Um, one, that the Yemeni government bandwagoned with the Houthis who are supported by Iran, and meanwhile, the Sunni opposition in that country is um, beginning to ban wagon with Al-Qaeda. I mean, the, and, and America, just think of this, America is engaged in an offensive against ISIS in Iraq and in Syria, and at the same time, what is unfolding in Yemen is the empowerment of the same Al-Qaeda that, or, or a branch, a branch of, um, um, of Islamic fundamentalism in, in, in Yemen. And I think that the Yemen experience is basically a prototype of what might become. If the Iranians go nuclear, we might see moderate Sunni states all allying with IS and Al-Qaeda that runs a counter purposes to American strategy in ISIS. So what should be the proper off-balancing policies, off, uh, offshore balancing policies of the United States? Well, I would argue that the United States should not be fighting ISIS. I know that this is very difficult. America has a perception that extends into foreign policy of a law enforcement mentality. This is why maybe ISIS is deliberately killing Americans to get, Amer um, to get Americans involved because overall it sees, it sees that um, as a plus rather than a, as an onus. I would argue that let Iraq become Iran's Vietnam. Iran has to solve the ISIS problem. 
It threatens Iran much more so than it threatens the United States and its Western allies. It's the only way economically we're, getting, we're, getting, we're going to get Iran down to its knees. Because when you look at the figures, with all the decline in oil, oil prices, it's going to bring about a decline of something like $10 billion in um, Iranian um, state coffers. But meanwhile, half of that is being offset by the defreezing of Iranian assets in the United States. And Iran has $80 billion in reserve. So it has a long time to play out before oil prices are really going to change, um, are, are really going to create a crisis, a domestic crisis in, in Iran. I was also surprised to learn that Iran has one of the lowest government expenditure to GDP ratios. In, in other words, it means that it has a very cheap, oppressive state system relative to its income. And the only thing that it's, is going to bring Iran down to its knees is if Iran becomes involved in, in an Iraqi I Vietnam. That's going to drive the costs very high. And if it tries using Iraqi oil to finance its involvement in Iran, in, 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 in Iraq, the Iraqi Shiite po um, population is going to rebel against Iran. We shouldn't forget that most of the Shiites fought on the Iraqi side against Iran in um, the first Gulf War. Are they involved in a Syrian Vietnam? Um, well, I, 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 the, the Syrian I, I, um, Vietnam is an extension, but, it won't, it, but, but the chief arena is going to be Iraq. That's, that's, that's the much larger arena. Um, and I think pressure, we have to pressure Iran on the nuclear issue, as we've been told. We have to shore up the pro-Western states. I wrote Lebanon. Lebanon is a real problem. It's also beginning to show that same kind of phenomena as the Yemenis government. It's beginning to bandwagon with Iran. The Lebanese army today is considered a partner, not a foe to Hezbollah. And we should be, and this is really part of the problem, and the Americans should address it. The Americans should strengthen U.S. Egyptian, U.S. Israeli ties at Turkey's expense. Just yesterday, I read in Al Quds Al Arabi a uh, denunci denunciation on the part of Erdogan against the Egyptian government for vilifying Yusuf Al Kardawi. Kardawi is the ideologue of the Muslim Brotherhood. The very fact that Erdogan takes that stand proves how his Islamist he is. This, is. this is a dimension that American foreign policy refuses to accept in its quest to use offshore balancing and consider it Iran and um, Turkey as, as, um, as potential allies in, 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 in this offshore balancing game. So in conclusion, I'll just say the solution is selectivity, it is the Asian pivot, it is allowing the states in the region to go, to go it alone, and I think Israel is strong enough now in its new alliance with a much more assertive Egyptian state um, to do it, um, but, but an offshore balancing that supports allies, not foes, weakens Iran rather than strengthening it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Frisch. And now we'll hear from Professor Ephraim Karsh, Obama's catastrophic legacy in the Middle East. Ephraim Karsh is Professor Emeritus of Middle East and Mediterranean Studies at King's College London and Professor of Political Studies at Bar Ilan University, where he's also Senior Research Associate at the Business Center for Strategic Studies. <coughs> Professor Karsh. Thank you very much. Uh, being the last one to speak gives the advantage that many of the things you wanted to say were already said, so they save you time. And on the other hand, you have a 
certain ideas that you can take issue with, and in this respect, I cannot resist really getting a shot at uh, Paul Kennedy's uh, theory, which is not really that original. I mean, Ibn Khaldun uh, espoused the same theory in medieval times, and Toynbee espoused it in the early 20th century. But if you look at the history of the 20th century, the empires didn't collapse because of overextension. They collapsed because of the rise of nationalism. Nationalism was the uh, empire buster, not overextension. So to pick on this theory today and to apply it to America, I think it's a bit of a stretch. And if we can accuse Obama of doing anything, it's not overextension, maybe it's underextension, especially in the Middle East. Uh, his policy has been uh, not up uh, to the task. Now, what I'll try to do is just, uh, I don't think Obama has a, a great uh, strategy. And uh, even a person like uh, Zbigniew Zezinski, with whom I don't tend to agree that often, and who used to mentor Obama in his early days when he was a senator and ran for the first time, said that at one point uh, that he admired Obama's ideas, and, uh, but he doesn't think he has a strategy for this. He said his rhetoric is always very compelling, very categorical, you must do that, you must do this. You cannot do this, this is unacceptable. But in fact, there is no strategizing, there is sermonizing. And, and I think this really uh, uh, categorizes uh, or describes Obama's uh, policy in the Middle East. Uh, this uh, dissonance or huge gap uh, between his sermonizing and his actual uh, performance. <clears throat> and I'll just try to show whatever mindset is behind this uh, sermonizing. <coughs> now, if we'll go again with all the limitations and pick a, some paradigm to describe his thinking about the Middle East, I would say that Obama falls into the Orientalist category. Uh, the category of Westerners who think patronizingly, they, they know better uh, the natives, uh, quote unquote, uh, in uh, third world areas in general, in the Middle East in, in particular, in the Islamic world, the Arab world, in, to be even uh, more specific. When he was young, Obama, of course, uh, took great effort to hide his Islamic background. I mean, even for uh, quite some time, didn't call himself Barak, uh, not to speak about the Hussein, uh, about his middle name but rather Bari, but at a certain point, once he got into the White House, he tried to make a lemonade out of this lemon, as the Americans say, and uh, fend the expertise in Islam on the grounds of his paternal family's uh, Islamic background, as he described it, and then he said, I lived uh, by Islam in an Islamic environment in three continents, America, Africa, Asia, and Indonesia, and uh, this allows me, in a way, to lecture you, obviously didn't say it in these words, uh, what Islam is and what Islam isn't. And as part of this, he, his administration went to grant lands to, to convince Americans what Islam isn't, and basically diluting any mention of Islamic uh, imperial history, of Islamic militancy, Islamic uh, worldwide agenda, and so on and so forth. And any cases of violence were, of course, attributed to people who are not real Muslims. So when Obama was killed in his speech uh, announcing the, the killing of Obama, he denied the fact that Obama was a Muslim leader because he killed many Muslims, and therefore no one would really mourn his death. Uh, similar rhetoric he used recently when he decided to move against ISIS, uh, the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. He said they cannot be Islamic uh, because uh, they kill Muslims. Of course, if you look at Islamic history, you see that despite the Prophet Muhammad's uh, stipulation to the contrary, Muslims killed Muslims uh, from the moment the Prophet died. Even his uh, grandson uh, was killed in a gruesome way uh, and his death is celebrated to these days by Shiites in the Ashura. And uh, far more Muslims were killed throughout Islamic history by Muslims than by Christians. So therefore, they couldn't care less if Bin Laden killed Muslims or ISIS is killing Muslims. Bin Laden, in Muslim perception, was a new Saladin. He was a leader that dared stay, stand up to the 
new crusading empire today, which is the United States, and therefore the 9-11 attacks were so widely applauded throughout the Arab and Muslim world, and his death was not celebrated. And the very fact that he could live in Pakistan under the eyes of the Americans and the, the local regime for so many years without being caught so indicates that in the final account uh, they didn't want to touch him because they knew that in their view he was an Islamic world. So the perception of Obama or Orientalist of his types, what Islam is and what Islam is not, of course doesn't stand up uh, to scrutiny. And this affects, of course, his relations uh, with, uh, with, uh, with this world. Uh, one example that was discussed already at some length here is, is the Iranian case. Um, I personally don't think that the Iranian nuclear weapon should be examined through the, the NPT uh, prism because I don't think it's a matter Thank you, Professor Karsh. You talked about the legacy of uh, President Obama. Uh, he's got another two years to go. So maybe we'll invite you back uh, two years from now. Uh, are there any questions to the speakers? Yes, Ruti Bum. Um, this, my question is for you, Dr. Lando, and uh, if I, for you after that, the same question. Um, does Iran perceive Israel as a military threat? It does not perceive the P5 plus 1. Does it perceive Israel as a credible threat? And if I, it is related to the same question, uh, does the Arab Do you want a straight away answer? Or? Yeah. Oh. Um, I would say uh, uh, if Iran were to be become a nuclear weapon state, uh, I believe that it would be deterred by Israel. Uh, I think uh, Iran believes, as most other states in the international community believe, that Israel has a nuclear deterrent. Um, and I think that would deter them from actually using uh, nuclear weapons. As far as Israel taking military action uh, in, the, in the context of the current dynamic, um, it's a good question. I, I would say that maybe they're a little less sure than they are with regard, I mean, I think they're pretty sure that the United States is not going to use military force, although that could change. But right now, I think that's the Iranian sense. With regard to Israel, it might be a little higher, but Israel itself is not projecting, really. Even though there is the rhetoric and the statements are made, I think if we look closely at um, Israeli statements over the years, Israel is not projecting any kind of eagerness to go for military action. So I think uh, Iran also notices that. About yes. Iran, uh, <coughs> you have to speak up because. Can I? Yeah. Excuse me. Okay, Professor about Israel Iran, I mean, I, I, I really think so. I, I, I really hope so. I mean, that uh, Iran thinks Israel is a military threat because then the deterrence will work. Yeah, and it may work, uh, even though there are indirect ways that you have seen in movies for many years how, uh, you know, these kind of rogue states can uh, get at other states with nuclear devices. The Arabs, I think. We <laughs> I think that's the essence of the Arab-Israeli problem. I mean, the Arabs don't accept the Jews as a nation. The Arabs don't accept the Jewish existence here. They think it's part of the Arab patrimony that is being encroached. So obviously, the COS is an entity that uh, they don't want to see. On the other end, obviously, Israel uh, serves uh, many purposes of specific regimes at specific times. Israel saved the Hashemites for a long time, so they can say whatever they want in public. Uh, in private, uh, there are disagreements. I mean, in Egypt at the moment, we have a, a good uh, collaboration uh, on the security level, which again shows how not such great uh, president from Israeli point of view, uh, Mubarak was. He could have closed the tunnels decades ago, which he never did anything about this. But uh, I think 
if you look what's the threat today, the concrete threat that the Arab uh, regimes uh, are, are afraid of, I think it's Iran uh, first and foremost, and then certain Arab regimes by some of these uh, militant Islamists uh, like ISIS or others. Yes, you have a question. What's Israel's capacity for military action now? Well, I can quote the head of my institute, Amos Yadlin, who is on record several times saying that Israel does have a military option. What exactly that military option is, is not clear. Uh, I would say that it's a safe bet to assume that Israel has some capability. It certainly, do, it certainly doesn't have the capability to take out Iran's nuclear program. America doesn't have that capability right now, unfortunately. If a military action were to be taken, the, it, I think, I mean, if it comes to that, what it should be is very targeted military uh, action against a number of nuclear facilities in order to have an impact on the negotiation, not in and of itself, because the nuclear program cannot be taken out with military force unless you're talking about the United States invading Iran and taking it over. And that's certainly not an option on the table. Yes, sir. Go ahead, you. Regarding the Iran Iraq uh, capability of production of oil and gas in 10 or 20 years from now, how important is to, let's say, to support the Kurdish, the war to support the Kurdish to take over the, the resources in, in Iraq to, to, to let prevent uh, to prevent Iran from taking over and so on. Thank you. The um, perceptions among the professionals is that Iraq contains all reserves similar to those of Saudi Arabia. And once uh, and if and when there are going to be a st stable geopolitical situation there, so uh, oil and gas companies will invest. The only ones who are ready to invest these days um, in, in, in Iraq itself are especially the Chinese, because the Western companies uh, are reluctant to invest there except for, uh, as you mentioned, in Kurdistan. In Kurdistan, uh, many international uh, oil and gas companies, Western companies, are investing. Um, and uh, the oil production of Kurdistan is uh, expected to grow about fivefold. Now, currently, they're producing 300,000 barrels a day uh, to about a million and a half in, in, in four to five years' time. Most of this oil is directed via uh, Turkey. Turkey enjoys much of the oil of uh, Kurdistan, northern Iraq, and also of ISIS. Um, according to our calculations, Turkey enjoys, uh, ISIS enjoys uh, revenues an, on an annual basis of one to one and a half billion dollars in oil uh, um, sales. Out of that, Turkey enjoys most likely one billion dollars because they get a very cheap oil from Iraq. From, from, from ISIS, including from, so uh, in this respect, uh, it's not only the, the Kurdish uh, um, um, motivation of Mr. Erdogan, it's also uh, revenues from oil, one uh, should think about that. So if there's going to be a stability in the long run, so the, the region is going to uh, enjoy much prospect as we saw in the IA pro, uh, uh, graph. Also vis-a-vis -vis Iran, um, Iran, before the Iraq-Iran war, uh, late uh, 70s, early 80s, produced 6 million barrels per day. Today, it produced about 2.5 million barrels. Before the sanctions, it produced 4 million barrels per day. So there's a lot of uh, room. Uh, they possess about one-tenth, uh, one so 10 percent of the world uh, proven uh, oil reserves, especially the Chinese, in the past, uh, uh, Japanese and other companies are willing to invest there. Thank you. That'll be the last question. Thank you. Um, again, on the Iranian issue, I just like to ask, assuming that the military option of the table, assuming that, uh, given that uh, the sanctions are not going to be made more severe, uh, President Obama made it clear that he will waive any mm -hmm. attempt. Uh, so the question at hand is, are the sanctions as they are now, are they not the motivation for the government <coughs> or not? If I understood correctly, Of Iran right now is not a country, it's a nation that is better for them than even 
What I would say is the following. It's, it's a, in order to be successful, you need the combination of the pressure but then using that leverage effectively at the negotiations table. Okay, so there's the leverage that you have, but then projecting to Iran that you have leverage and therefore you are gonna make certain demands and you're not going to be afraid that Iran is going to leave the table, for example. So what we saw over the last year is there was pressure it was not used as effectively as it could have been at the table. So my answer to you is, yes, uh, uh, there are still sanctions that are hurting Iran. If the negotiators start getting serious about conducting a tough negotiation, which is what they are engaged in, that's the game Iran is playing, rather than this game of let's move forward to a shared a goal and hearing Secretary of State Kerry say, you know, praise Iran for their wonderful cooperation, that's not going to get them to the deal that they want. It, the second part of my answer would be, I'm not as sure as you are that there won't be additional sanctions. I think there's going to be some kind of struggle between uh, Congress and the administration. Hopefully, there are also voices talking about the fact that the two need to come to some kind of compromise on additional sanctions. Um, and that would be the best option, because having a struggle here is not good, you know, f uh, obviously for the negotiations and, and for other reasons. But I think with the new Congress, there is a chance that there will be a lot more pressure for more sanctions, especially in light of recent, you know, we just heard the recent reports, this uh, big article that came out in Foreign Policy, that Iran is still trying to procure uh, components for the Iraq uh, facility in contravention to sanctions and the spirit of the interim deal. So uh, there, the, things could change over the coming months. We have your one question or insist on asking this question. Would you estimate how many minutes No, the question the question's clear. It's the question is clear. Okay. It's the last question, it's clear. You don't, you don't need to elaborate. You need to answer that one. No, no, I'm not <laughs> Okay. Just leave it in minute. We'll leave the question in the air. No, no. We, we want to thank the speakers and thank the audience. We have an intermission.